So this talk is going to be about clustering, which is not really something people often study in Pernodesk complexity, but this is probably one of the, not the first, but one of the first works about this. Yeah, and we'll show a nice results about tractability, which is, which is not like, <coughs> which has some interesting properties. Anyhow, the problem we're interested in is the clustering problem. We have our input is some set of points in the plane or in higher dimension, generally in RD. And we want to cluster them. What does this mean? We want to split them on clusters. Basically say that these points are first cluster, these points are the second cluster, these points are the third cluster. And now we want to also set a pick a, some cluster center, so it's another point for each of the clusters. And now the cost of this is just for all cluster, for, for each clusters, the cost of the cluster is the sum of distances from every point to this cluster center. So we sum distance from this to the center, this to the center, this to the center, and this four numbers give the cluster cost. And so on for all other clusters. And the whole cost is the sum of costs of each cluster. And the distance we could use is actually, it could be different things. It could be, for instance, for the k-means problem, it's the square distance of the Euclidean distance, square Euclidean di distance. It may be just Euclidean distance, with, and then the problem is k-median. It may be some other Manhattan, Hyman distance, whatever you please. Yeah, but the probably the most studied notion is notions are k means and k-medians. Yeah, so this is intuition, and that is how a problem is formally defined. We're given a multiset x of n vectors in Zd. Z means, means, means that the integer, this is somewhat important for our study. I will later explain why, but really, generally, it's not that important. Yeah, we, we're given how many clusters there should be, and we're given this cost bound, which we want to verify if we can fit our clusters into this cost bound. So basically, can we partition these points into k clusters, so k just k subsets of the points, and find k vectors in Rd such that this sum of distances is most d, where we sum over all clusters, and with inside cluster, we, si we sum over all points in the cluster, the distance from this point to the cluster center. Yeah. So this is, this is defined for, uh, for, k me for k means, where we have the Euclidean norm and squared of this. Yeah, so this is the cluster problem. Um, about the motivation, generally, it's, uh, it's a very important tool in uh, machine learning, data science, and other stuff. So I don't probably won't spend a lot of time motivating this problem. It's quite well known as it is. Okay, so what, is, what was known about this problem? There, there was this famous Lloyd's heuristic or Lloyd's algorithm, which is take some random centers, then cluster points, then again shift the centers, and so on which probably is studied a lot. Yeah. And there were other heuristics based on it, or independent ones. And basically, that is how people solve clustering in, in the real world. So they just run some heuristics and stuff, and it often works well. But from the complexity point of view, this problem is not that easy. We know that it's NP-hard even for two clusters. We know it's NP-hard even, even in the plane. A good thing is it's somewhat solvable if we have a really small dimension and a really small number of clusters. So there is an algorithm which runs in time into the big O of decay, which is given by Nabe et al. And this is based on some algebraic uh, computational algebraic geometry, so it's not really that fast, I guess, really. So I don't think people really use it in practice. But so on. Um, <coughs> yeah, so basically this doesn't really look very good in terms of complexity because, I mean, it's MP hard here, MP hard there, and we only have this. And moreover, there was, there was also a lower bound like a final lower bound of the form, you cannot solve this problem faster than n to the omega of k, even for constant dimension. But this, is, this was for a bit of a different variant of the problem one. In my definition, the cluster center could be anything. It could be any point in Rd. But in this paper, the cluster center was one of the given set. Yeah. So up to this technicality, this, this result kind of shows also that this algorithm is as best as possible, though not really formally. But we cannot really hope to be good just by having d and k small. Yeah. Also, there was, uh, of course, a lot of work about approximation algorithms for k clustering because, really, in practice, probably people don't really care about the exact solution, but 1 plus epsilon is fine also. And here, there were a lot of nice results. For instance, the corset line of research, which is very long and extensive. For instance, there is a poly k over epsilon corset. I think it's even k over epsilon squared. And since, uh, of course, that means that we can su pick some small number of points such that the instance which has only these points is the same as the original instance. 
So it's basically a kernelization, if or like classic kernelization in terms of process complexity. But anyhow, since we have since we can reduce instance to this many points, we autom automatically have an algorithm in this time, basically. Yeah, and this was given here. Yeah, but so from parameterized complexity point of view, again, I was at, it wasn't studied much. So probably the closest pro paper to what I will present in is this paper about binary clustering in Hamming distance. Actually, I studied also the low rank approximation and other stuff, but this is the result which is closest to our result. Yeah, and I were giving, so you remember that D capital is the kind of our budget. So how many, what is the total cost of the clustering we are expected to have? And if it's, if it's small, then we actually are able to give an FPT algorithm in here. So there is an algorithm in time d to the d and polynomial in n and d, where n is number of points, d smallest dimension. What about k? A k can be arbitrary here. So like, actually, if this thing is small, the capital D, then k is kind of supposed to be large. Because if you, have, if you pay really a small cost compared to number of points, then a lot of these points have to be kind of in, a, in their own clusters, or they have to be equal. So really, k here would be either really big, or there will be a lot of points which are the same. So when we parameterize by d capital, really k doesn't now make, more, make much sense. It's, it's supposed, to be, supposed to be large or not small, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and yeah, but formally k could, could be arbitrary here in this result. So yeah, so this actually this presentation gives the problem more like uh, editing flavor. So we have some, we have some data set which we know is close to the actual clustering of the points, but then there are some small number of d mistakes in here, and we have to correct it to, to kind of make this into a real clustering, and this will be also the setting of our work. Yeah, so anyhow, in our study, we focus on the exact version of the problem, so we don't allow for any approximation to solve the problem exactly. And we parameterize with respect to D, may, plus maybe some other parameters in some of, the, in some of our results. And again, this, this is kind of an analytic flavor, so we want to have an instance which is nearly clustering and then tweak it to actual clustering by spending not too much time. Also, I was saying that the input is an integer. It's not really that important, but the problem is that when we bound D capital, it must have some some kind of uh, some kind of scale. So if input is arbitrary points, then it doesn't really matter that d is small because points can also be can lie in like in the sphere of radius 1,000 or so on. But then when points are integer, it kind of gives a scale. So really, when d is small, when capital D is small, then the actual clustering costs. Then the points are really not far from each other, or or a lot of them are the same kind of. Yeah, but the cluster centers are allowed to be any points in RD, basically. Though for most of the, like for most natural versions, like Euclidean norm, L1 norm, or like Hamming norm, these points will actually be in like, will be somehow tractable. So for instance, for the k-means case, the cluster center is always the, the just co by coordinate average of the points in the cluster. So it's always some rational number with some kind of small denominator. For L1 norm, it will be just always one of the integers because it's a median of the points and so on. And we studied the problem with relation to various distances. So the I was stating the problem for just the squares of Euclidean distances, but generally we consider this distance of the form this p, where this p is just the pth power of the p norm of the vector. And we also consider the special cases of distance zero and distance infinity when this is the L0 norm or Hamming norm, just number of coordinates where the, the distance between the points is just number of coordinates where they differ. And this is the and infinity norm, the maximum of the coordinate by current difference. Like, it is kind of natural that this is the one limit case of this, and this is another limit case of this. This is zero, and when this is infinity. Yeah. And why it's all interesting, generally <coughs> picking a different measure c compared to the Euclidean distance kind of allows us to, to emphasize on different things. For instance, you can see these two pictures. These are clusterings, are optimal clustering for the case L1, and this is optimal clustering for the case L1 fourth. So this, so you can see that when we have lower p, it basically penalizes less the spread of the cluster, but penalizes more kind of the amount of directions we have. So in this clustering, it's more fine to have these long lines than to have something which is close but onto, onto these different coordinates immediately. So this point was in the red cluster because it was like this, but then it became into the green cluster because really this is not bad enough. Like, since uh, <coughs> you can look at the distance definition 
here. And basically, if p is small, then if the distance between x and y is large but only in one coordinate, then this distance would be first traced to like some power, so it won't be really contributed this, contribute this, this much. But if the distance is small but in a lot of coordinates, then it will be worse when pi is going lower. Yeah. So this measure, so the change of measure basically changes this priorities between a lot of different coordinates and a lot of total change, uh, and small total change. Anyhow, this is, yeah, it's about different measures. And let's start with some simple observations just to get the flavor of the problem. So imagine we are in L2, so we have just our usual Euclidean distance. Then we can, we can show that, or this is a well-known thing, that if we have a given set of points, then actually the cluster center, which minimizes the total distance, will always be there by current average. So we know exactly what this set should be if we know already which points are in which cluster. We just like, take the sum of all points and divide by the number of the points as vectors. So this is fine. So basically for L2 case, we don't really need to we need, don't really need to find the actual centers. They are already given by the clustering, if you know the clustering. And actually vice versa. And it's, this works even like for any clustering, for any, for any distance. If we, are given, if we are given a set of cluster centers, then we can always determine the optimal clusters, if, provided that these are the cluster centers. Because since the point always pays the distance from this point to its cluster center, it always makes sense to take this point and set it to the cluster, which is determined by the closest cluster center. It doesn't make sense to put this point into this cluster since this one is closer. So whenever we have fixed set of cluster centers, we can always forget about the actual clustering. The, the actual clustering follows from a set of cluster centers always. Yeah. And so we can reformulate the problem a bit. We can now, in a region formulation, it was asked, can we find partition on k sets and k cluster centers such that this is minimized? But now we can just ask, can we find k vectors such that this is minimized? When we just, for every point, we take closest of these centers and then sum over all the points. Or not minimized in our case is, can we, do, can we make it at most d? Anyhow, this is some simple, simple things. Let us move to the, the actual results. So for, we start with the L1 case. So here the distance is just, you know, the Manhattan <coughs> distance where we, the distance between two vectors is just sum over all coordinates, the absolute value of the difference between this value and the coordinates. Yeah, and we want to minimize this again. We again want to find the k center such that this is at most d. Actually, for the case of L1, we know that if we have a fixed cluster, then its center is necessarily a median by coordinate. So if we have, in the case of L2, it was by coordinate average, and now it's just by coordinate median. And from that, it follows that we have a trivial end to the DK algorithm, because in every coordinate, in every cluster, we just pick which is which, which just brought forth all possible values of the median, since the value of the median is always one of the present values in this, among the points in this coordinate. So basically, in time n to the d, we can brute force uh, all the uh, possible cluster centers, and then just brute force k of them. It will be at most n to the dk. Yeah, but we want to do something better, of course. So now we'll present this algorithm, which is runs in time d capital to the d, or with some constant, and polynomial in n d. So again, if d is small, then this is kind of good. So I briefly will sketch the proof. I assume that the points are distinct. distinct. If you have two points which are distinct and then in the same cluster, then the cost it must at is at least one of this cluster. That, and that means that we cannot have really at most, we cannot have more than d of these composite clusters. The, by composite, I mean <coughs> clusters when we have at most two distinct, at, at least two distinct points. So clusters like this, I call them composite, and it cannot really, it cannot really be a lot of them at most d. And moreover, there can be at most two D points in this cluster, because every one of them has at least two points, and, yeah, and every point pays at least one. So really, only a very small number of points is interesting in some sense. Because for, for the points which are not in the composite clusters, they just pay zero, because they are the only point in the cluster, and they are their own center of the cluster, and so on. They don't really contribute to anything. We are only interested in finding these points, identifying these points, and then clustering these points, which are interesting. And it's not too many of them. The natural thing to do here is to do a color coding. We can randomly color the points, and with good probability, we will have that all of these interesting points are colored differently. So in this case, so this would be the usual probability of coloring them right, which is, which is good enough for us, because it's just exponential in D. Yeah. 
And then we, can also, we should also try all the possible ways to split the colors between the clusters. So basically, for instance, in this instance, say we already have, we don't really know this clustering, but we have the colors on the points, we assign them randomly, and we know that all of, this, all of these interesting points have different colors. So we can also brute force that actually red and blue are in, the same, in one cluster, and green, magenta, and brown are in another cluster. We don't really know yet which, which of the red points actually are in the cluster, but we can brute force that this cluster is one red point and one blue point. We don't really know yet which point is this. So this gives, gives us a reduction to this auxiliary problem, which is probably kind of interesting on its own. In this auxiliary problem, we have t sets of points. Again, a number t, which is our budget. And we have to choose one point from each of the sets, such that this is minimized. Basically, it's, it is kind of a problem of identifying one cluster, but we also know that all of the points in this cluster will be colored differently. So from each of the sets will come out one point, and we will turn this into a cluster. So yeah, so this is just the cost of taking one point of this set and, uh, yeah, and clustering this somehow. Yeah. This is our clear problem, and basically the idea is if we can solve this problem, then we can solve our original problem, because whenever we brute force, whenever we have some coloring, and whenever we brute force this partition of these colors in the coloring, then to identify cluster X1, I just have to solve cluster selection on all the red and all the blue points. So basically, all the red points will be one of the sets, all the blue points will be another set in this cluster selection problem. And our task will be to select one red point and one blue point, such that the cluster has small costs, where this cost can also be actually brute force. Yeah. And when we do this repeat, when we do this for all of this kind of color classes, then we solve our original problem, because now we just have, like, for every of these sets of colors, we have a cluster, which we know it's optimal by the cluster selection problem. So now it remains only to solve this problem. And some, again, to get the flavor, some boring ideas about how to solve this problem. For instance, we can try just all possible clusters in this time, which is, yeah. Because we can just, for every set, we can just check which point we select, and then it's easy if you know which point we select from each set. We just find the optimal cluster center. We can also solve it in this time, because if we fix, we can say that, say for x1, we know which point we take. We just take, we just try all possible endpoints from this cluster, and then we, then what we can do? We can just look at this point x1, and then we know that cluster center is not further from this point, is not further than d from this point, because this is one part of this sum, and this whole sum is d. So then, if we, if we know the cluster center is not farther than d from our point x1, which we fixed already, then we can just take our x1, po our point x1, take our coordinates, and then just try and move the value of x1 in all the coordinates by, by d, up or down. So it will be 2d plus 1 possible values for each coordinate, and then this will be the whole time to try all possible cluster centers. So this is also not, not too good because it's exponential in D, but it gives us a nice idea that actually if we fix one point here, then it kind of restricts the, the number of cluster centers which we should consider. And the, the actual solution will also follow this idea. Yeah, but another thing is actually there are, it's not just this is at most D, there are also at most D coordinates when X1 and C differ. So basically, if we identified x1, we can just try all possible values of x1, so it's fine. And we know the coordinates when they differ, then it's fine, because they differ in most d coordinates, and in each coordinate, by it most d capital. Since d capital is small, we can really try everything now, if we know which coordinates are there. Yeah. But we don't really know which coordinates are there. So the, actually, the interesting part of the algorithm is to identify the set of coordinates where x1 and c differ. And after this, it will be... Yeah, and for this, we employ this kind of machinery with hypergraphs. So we fix our point, our point from the first set, and then I build a hypergraph. Basically, this hypergraph shows where the points, where the other points of the inputs are different from the x1. So the vertices of this hypergraph are just the coordinates. It's just we have one vertex for each of the coordinates from 1 to d. And edges of this hypergraph are for each, exactly one edge per each of the points in the, in the input set. And the positions of this, like the, the vertices which are included in this edge, are exactly the positions where x1 is different from this xj for which we construct an edge, uh, from this x which we construct an edge. And basically, since every point which, is, which can be in the same cluster can have distance at most d to this x1, then the size of this edge also is at most d capital. Because, yeah. because the whole cluster cost is at most d, then there cannot be two points which are in distance at most more than d. Anyhow, and if we look at one 
with one potential solution, then this solution induces a side hypergraph. Where we have at most capital D vertices because they cannot be more than capital D coordinates when the points are different. And there are also at most capital D edges because they also cannot be more than capital D points which are different from our points. Yeah. So here for one simple example, we can look at, like we have our five, five, five dimensional space. We have fixed our x1. It has some values somewhere. And we have some other points. And what we do again? These vertices are one vertex for each coordinate. And for every point, we construct an edge. So basically, first point will yield us edge 2 and 5 on 2 and 5, because it's different from x1 in coordinates 2 and coordinate 5. So like this is the edge corresponding to the first point. And analogously, this is the edge corresponding to the second point. It, can, it differs from x1 in 1 and 5. And this is like, is this the, this is the this loop at the third, because it's only difference in 1, and this edge is the fourth. Yeah. And if you look at the solution, for instance, let, let's say that, that Actually, we should take these three points in the solution. Then the solution gives us some side hypergraph, and it has not too many edges at most two, and it has not too many vertices at most two. Again. So now the idea is to, since we have this bound, we can try to somehow bound combinatorially the number of this sub hypergraphs which we are interested in. If we can do that, then we will win. And the idea is as follows: Here we try all possible arch of this form. And then we tr try to find all this possible ash and dream. Of course, straightforwardly, this won't gi give anything because for every possible hypergraph and every possible location of hypergraph in another, there cannot be any win in considering this, in considering this thing because there, are, there could be a lot of hypergraphs. But then we will use this theorem that, that actually if we have small fractional edge cover number of, of h, then we actually can't do this in, the, in sufficient, sufficiently fast because, yeah. Just really matter what this means. Basically, this means that if this is constant, then this is polynomial, this is polynomial, and this only depends on d, on d capital. Or basically, it is like d capital to the power of d capital. So this will give us our desired runtime. If we will, if we will be able to prove that fractional edge cover number of h is small. Yeah. So again, we uh, our general strategy is try all possible h and try to find them. And provided this holds, we will do it with this use of this theorem in quite a short time. So I have to do a remark that actually this whole discussion kind of is a bit similar to problem Marx was solving in his paper there. There was a consensus patterns problem. And so this is kind of a slight general, somewhat a generalization of this. But the line of the proof is somewhat similar. And again, fractional edge cover is just you know, the usual edge cover number is just the size of the smallest edge cover. And the fractional edge cover number is it's kind of a relaxation of this notion. So the, say for the triangle, the edge cover number is just two. We have to use two edges to cover all the vertices. But the fractional cover number is one point one and a half. Because if we set half to each edge, then we cover all the vertices. Where cover means that sum of edges adjacent to this, instead to this vertex, is at most one, is, should, should be at least one. And basically, the main idea, which actually gives us this FPT algorithm, is that for our hypergraphs, which are interested to us, they, are, they actually have their fractional edge cover number at most two. And the intuition here is quite simple, actually, because each vertex in H is covered by at least half edges in H. From that, it follows that this is at most two, because if this holds, we just assign two over number of edges to each edge, and then each vertex sums to at least one. But that holds just because Vertex, what is a vertex? We just have to remember what the construction was. Vertex is a coordinate where x1 and c differ. And h is another point x. So basically, h doesn't cover vertex exactly when x1 and this x1 which we picked as the point in the cluster and x, this arbitrary point, has equal value there. And basically, if more than half points have the same value, then c also must have the same value because with the L1 distance, it doesn't really make sense to have a value which is different from more than half of the other values in the same column or in the same coordinates. So that's this, this thing actually transforms to this statement. And then we can use all of this machinery. Yeah, and this is it. OK, this is just remem remember the algorithm. I will skip this. Yeah, so the, actually, the funny thing about this, about this whole problem is that for L1, and actually for all the LPs where P is at, at most 1, 
this algorithm worked, works. It's in FPT, in FPT, FPT time on the capital, it solved the problem. But for L2 norm, the cluster selection sub problem is doubly hard for, for the capital and also even for T. So basically, this shows us that the same approach couldn't really work for L2. Though, really, we don't really know what happens with L2 at all. So we do know that this approach doesn't work because this is doubly hard, but we don't know if there is an FPT algorithm for, the, for just the clustering problem. Because it actually really follows from this, it actually really follows that the, cluster, the original cluster problem is also double hard on D. But anyhow, just to give a sketch how, why, this, why this is true, let's remember our cluster selection problem. How does it look like? We have some, some sets of points, and we have to select exactly one point and select some cluster center such that the resulting cluster has cost at most D capital. So now I will show a reduction from a multicolored clique, which will give us the double hardness of this thing. Or double hardness just means that we cannot solve this problem faster than we cannot solve the problem in FPT time. So in some f of the d capital times some polynomial in m. Yeah, and reduction will be more or less easy because what we will do we will have from the from our click instance we will produce a class selection instance where the coordinates are just the vertices. Every vertex here is one its its own coordinate, and the point sets are the Pair of pairs of colors. Basically, we will take all the edges between color red and color blue and make every edge into a point, and it will be all the same set. So, we, in the final solution, we will pick exactly one point of this color, and the same for all the pairs of colors as well. So, basically, for every edge in the original graph, we have one point, and the coordinates are like in natural way of the instance matrix. Just every edge produces a point with two ones in the coordinates corresponding to its endpoints. So, H12 is one and one, one and two, zero, zero. And one, three is one and one, one and three, zero, zero. And what this class selection does, does again, it selects one edge from each column, uh, from, each, from each of the groups. And basically, for the clustering, for, 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 the, for this instance, it means that we select one edge between each of the color classes. So basically, we select a click, if you uh, if are like. And it can actually shown that, really, if our cost is small enough, then we only can select a click in this way. So basically, here, if we select a click, then all the ones are nicely picked in, in the k columns. So we have k columns, or we have k minus one ones, and all the other points, and all the other coordinate zeros. Then we can bound the cost and see that really, if the cost is this, then the instance is, is a click. Or like here, it's, if instance is a click, then the, cost is, uh, then the cost is not high. But then if the instance is not a click, then ones are not that nicely packed, and then this will produce a larger cost. Yeah. So this, is, this was a sketch by why, why is it true that it's double on heart? Yeah. So this is kind of an interesting, interesting dichotomy with the different, different distances. <coughs> but anyhow, so let me just have a full list of our results in this paper. So I was going through this algorithm, which is like the only algorithmic result in this paper. It also generalizes to any no LP norm which is at most one. I also shown that it's double on heart for L2, and this, the same holds for actually for every p which is greater than 1. So this gives, again, a nice dichotomy. We know that this is FPT, but we, no, we don't know what is this really, but we do know that it, doesn't, it, it couldn't work with the same approach. It's either double heart on D, capital at all, or it may be FPT, but with a completely different approach. And also, f f funny thing about this is, for instance, for L0, which is kind of a limit measure of these things, it, the problem is, is actually the original clustering problem is actually double hard on D capital. So for L1 we had FPT algorithm, but here it's double hard. And even even if D is small, is also small, so the, the dimension it still doesn't help. And for L infinity we also know that this is double hard on D capital. So again, for this we have double hardness, for this we have double hardness, for this we have FPT, and for this we don't know if it's FPT or not. So this is the state of this is the st state of things after the results in our paper. Yeah. And just to conclude, so what's, there are of course a lot of open questions about this, but like the ones which fill the gaps in our paper most closely is for instance, we don't really, or okay, this, this first question is more like the general question. So if for L at most zero, or for L greater than zero, we don't know the problem actually is if PTW hard on D and K. Again, there was this XP algorithm an, an old XP algorithm, and to the power of DK for L2, and basically it works for L1 as well, and so on. For L1, there was a trivial algorithm, but anyhow. 
we, there was hardness, but for the restricted case when the cast of centers are selected from some fixed set, so we don't really know if even 4L2 is double hard on GNK in the general setting when the cost of centers are anything. And we also don't know like for all the other variants of LP is double hard or not. So this is like a really interesting question. Like if it was, I was really doubted, but if it's FPT, then it would be like really good. Again, for L2, as I said already, we don't really know if it's a particular heart on D capital. We know that we know only about this sub problem cluster selection, but it's not, it doesn't really follow that original clustering is double heart after the cluster selection is double heart. And of course, there is a question of can we use other metrics to obtain something efficient or like maybe something just interesting? Or can we use other parameters of the data set? Maybe like s s there are some known parameters of the matrix. You can define matrices. Maybe it, it may be useful in design in FPT or like another kind of fast targets for this problem. Okay, this is all. <laughs>